Well, everyone, welcome to another Floor Life webinar. Today, it's a little bit of a different format as instead of just a presentation, we let you choose the topic. We asked you to send us questions, any questions you had for Steve Dom. Steve is Floor Life's Director of Superfloor Technologies. He's a longtime uh, floral industry vet, and he is definitely the expert in cut flower care and handling. And so we asked you to just submit any question you had for him, and then we would discuss it during this hour session that we have. So I'm gonna go over the questions that we got. We got quite a lot and I summarize them into bundles. So we have five main topics we're gonna to discuss. But in the meantime, if you have any questions during this presentation or during um, our discussion, do send them to us in the chat as you've been doing. And at the end, we're gonna try and answer as many as we can. If we can't, don't worry, we will reach out to you personally and get in touch with the answer you're looking for. Um, but as if we have the time, we'll, we'll try and get to it here live. So Steve, welcome and thank you for having coffee, tea, water with me. Hello. Cheers. Good Cheers. morning, everybody. Welcome. Good day. So one question that kept coming back is about the current global floral shortage. So the past year has been quite a roller coaster for everyone and almost every industry. And the floral industry hasn't been excluded. And we noticed that there is a shortage of flowers. And the question people have is, why is there a shortage? And how does this affect the different channels in the industry? So that's a, it's a great question. Actually, it's one um, that we see in a lot of other formats of people talking about the flower shortage. So. Um, the question starts to say, are the, are the farms globally producing less flowers? The, the answer is no, they're not. What has happened is there's been a shift in the channels globally. Uh, flowers are finding their way uh, to customers um, in, in different channels. So here in the U.S., we kind of work on three channels. We work on the, uh, the super floor channel, which is the supermarkets and the big boxes. The, the next channel is the old wholesale to retailer channel. And the third channel, of course, was the e-commerce channel. And they kind of, the flowers moved to the marketplace to the customers moving in one of those three directions. The supermarket channel has been growing over the last 20 years. Of course, the e-commerce channel was new to the marketplace and they started definitely growing. But all of a sudden, all three channels started not stealing from everybody, but growing all at the same time. So this has uh, basically moved the flowers um, into profitably, by the way, so for, for growers, uh, into these channels, finding demand in different places. So it has created a demand um, all at the same time. And, it's, and it's, it's also generating some logistical issues. Uh, the airlift out of the growing areas of the world, um, understand that most of the flowers are growing in the equator around the world. And there has to be an airlift or, or an ocean freight shipping, which is now moving quite a bit. But the pandemic kind of forced people into a different shopping or buying pattern, therefore creating the supermarket as one location where people were trying to, to enjoy something at home. And the flowers definitely brought that to it, as we all know and, and thank God exists. And at the same time, as certain parts of the world have awakened, uh, people are going back to getting married, getting together, restaurants are reopening, creating a demand that really wasn't there in the past, especially last year. So um, I, I think the shortage actually is because the flowers are moving. And I know some of the other questions have to do with this, but um, those channels uh, have all started to grow. I think over time, they'll probably, they'll probably settle into a, to a pattern. But right now, they're all moving globally in, in a growth pattern, uh, Georgina. Okay. And so do you notice that there are any quality issues? And if there are, what kinds of issues? Well, so because of the stress logistically that I mentioned a minute ago that's happened. Um, some parts of the world, uh, especially uh, in the center of the world, the equator part, um, airlift has become difficult. Um, we're also moving other things by air that are important, such as uh, pandemic material uh, from shots to everything. And it's created kind of a shift in transportation. And that shift in transportation has put a stress on the cargo lift and the ocean freight. Certain ports are having a difficult time moving product through. Uh, there is a reduction in labor, uh, not only at the ports and at the airports, but also even at the farm. Certain countries are 
are generating less density, uh, permitting less density at, at farm level or, or at uh, production level. This, in fact, all these things play a role and it's slowing down the movement of the flowers. And whenever you add time and possibly improper temperature or improper cold chain, you start to add and to, and to, and to affect the quality. So yeah, we are seeing that. And um, the good suppliers of the industry, hopefully the ones we're working with, uh, you're working with globally, are, are, are working hard to minimize or, or um, I mean, we have customers who are actually renting out whole planes in order to avoid moving through uh, the difficult combination channel. Um, but uh, yes, we are seeing in quality issues. So more than ever now, proper care and handling plays even a more important role. So it's actually even being good for companies like Floralife that, and, um, who, who take part in this, assuring that the quality of the flower or preparing the flower to move through this channel, this difficult channel. And uh, good preparation will, will definitely get the flower um, the ability to hopefully do it and give that customer the days that we still want them to have. And so what's your personal opinion? How long do you think this shortage will last? And do you have any predictions or recommendations for the future? So yeah, um, and I, I wouldn't say they're mine. I, I, I enjoy the fact that I get to speak to a lot of people on different sides of the marketplace from the growers to the bouquet makers, uh, to the e-commerce people, to the supermarkets. Um, first, let me just mention a couple of things because when you say, how long is it going to last? I think we're going to see issues of this, whether it be transportation, um, for quite a while. Um, and and um, so if we're going to call it a shortage, which I think it feels like that, uh, the ramping back up to where we have what we need for the marketplace that's demanding it is going to require quite a bit of time because I'll, I'll give you one brief example that will kind of bring it to head. Let's say I am a grower and I have a demand for more for more flowers. So you probably would say, well, why don't you expand your farm? Great idea. I need to now have the plastic. I need to have the labor, which I'm having a hard time finding. I need to have the infrastructure. I need to have the airspace. And even something as basic as the actual plants that I wanna put in the ground, the breeders are trying to catch up. So all these things, all this catch up time, everybody kind of initially was saying a year. Now we're looking at from this point, 18 to 24 months, to be absolutely where the marketplace is getting what they need when they need it. So we're, we're looking at a long period of time on this. And, um, and, and um, we're hearing that from all levels, from the breeding all the way through the consumers. Um, and um, and I'll be honest with you, some people are doing very well with this because um, they're moving flowers very quickly. There's no, there's no marketplace that sometimes plays with the pricing. People are getting what they're hoping for. And it's been a profitable thing for certain parts of the channels of the industry. Thank you for that. Another big topic that was very popular was flower quality. And um, the question was, how do we guarantee this optimal consumer enjoyment? So what do, you, what do you feel are the most important steps that are needed to guarantee that great customer experience? Well, everything I've mentioned, um, I've talked about the, um, the difficulty of doing it correctly now. There is no doubt cost has affected every single level of this. And I hate to be basic about it, but it's going to cost more to get flowers to the marketplace. And the price of the product is going to have to increase. Um, I'm not going to be scared. Even with our own company, we've had price increases that's affecting us terribly. Um, from the cost of trucking within the U.S., for example, I'm sure in Europe's the same. That's gone up. Air lift has gone up. Um, competitiveness, whenever there's a tight market, the price goes up. So I hate to be basic, but I think we're going to have to start paying more for flowers to assure that the quality maintains. If you remove the profitness of this, the flower quality drops. It is just uh, paramount to recognize that. So that, that I think is the one thing. The other thing we have to recognize is that we have to learn from the lessons and understand what the market's demanding from us. So let's just take one real quick, other quick example, the e-commerce channel, which has enjoyed a huge growth. Uh, as the world reawakens, probably that'll drop down, but they'll keep some of that business because the experiences that people are having now with e-commerce and or buying from a supermarket and or getting it from the retail floors are good. The flowers are performing well. People are enjoying the flowers at the home. 
but we've learned a lesson on how to move the product. And, um, and it, it does require uh, investment in time, logistics, um, knowledge. Uh, knowledge is one that's really important, variety selection, all these things. So I think we need to remember those and keep those in our, in our, in our, in our pocket at all times in order to, uh, to keep this moving forward as we all hope it does. Yeah. So actually now more than ever, it's very important that people invest time and effort into the care and handling of these flowers. For without this. A doubt. Yeah. Yeah. Without a doubt, not to make too much of a commercial, but you're absolutely correct. I mean, uh, if you treat and post harvest treat and, uh, abide by the cold chain. And, um, and of course, on your end, if you do what you're supposed to do, that consumer is going to have that positive experience, which will make them want to come back. And they have been having it. The U.S. marketplace and in Europe, it's always been a little better than here in the U.S. The consumer is enjoying those seven days and the flowers are developing and, and, uh, and people are coming back, which is there also. That's, that's generating this increased interest in the product line. And, um, and maybe not causing, but being part of the demand that that's, we see growth in. Yeah. Yeah, we've been promising these seven days base life um, in supermarkets and in floristries, and it's what people are used to and what they've come to expect. So, yeah, need to make sure. Right. And, and, and Georgina, it's a good point. They come to expect it. And, and in the past, and again, I speak for the U.S. marketplace, but I think this is global. When, when the flowers didn't last the, the seven ideal days, uh, unfortunately, many times consumers blame themselves. They say, well, I'm not good with flowers. Uh, you know, I, you know I, I kill them. Well, then that, that pushes them away from, um, from buying flowers in the future. And that's a shame. Um, when in fact, it, it, it may not have been their fault. I'm not saying it always wasn't their fault, but um, it may not have been their fault. They may have purchased product that was not at the right cut stage or, or handled well at a supermarket or a retail floor. So yes, the handling of it in all and all aspects of the channel are very important. And when done correctly, uh, really allows the customer um, to, to have the tools in order to have that enjoyment. I mean, uh, obviously we sell a little flower food sachet. That, that is one of the examples of a tool that when the consumer uses it, uh, it actually gives them that experience. And people say the flowers lasted, they developed, the water stayed clear. Uh, well, what a great experience. And then, you know, next week I'll go back. So you're absolutely correct. And, and this goes all the way from the farm, all the way, all the way to the consumer. You're absolutely correct. Yeah. Then I had a very specific question. So it's about hydrangeas. Um, and it's, what do you recommend for care and handling for hydrangeas in very hot temperatures? So that is probably the best example of what we call in the industry at this time, a hydration sensitive crop. Um, hydrangeas are, very large flowers headed. So the surface area of a hydrangea uh, is probably, and we've done this through genetics, by the way, we've probably put too much flower on the size of the stem that hydrangea is. And uh, now the market demands that. Um, and by the way, when you see a, a, a cut hydrangea in a vase, it is a beautiful sight. New colors and the new variety. Um, so I think the recommendation we have to start from the, the farm. Uh, and here, obviously, variety selection is key. So let's assume that's been done correctly. And I assume when you're talking about the temperature, you mean the handling of it at the end. But let's still talk about the temperature, even in the growing area. Uh, we want to make sure that we're growing the right variety at the altitude, uh, uh, temperature, day length that is ideal for that. So uh, the reason I'm starting there is because nothing will solve that problem. You grow the wrong product at the wrong temperature, you're going to get the wrong flower. It's just genetically, that's just the way it works. we have to start there. Uh, the next thing is very important is water quality. Um, and this goes throughout the whole channel. You want the farm to assure that the quality of water they're using, not only for irrigation, but most importantly for post-harvest, is one that is um, very good quality uh, with the salt content not affecting it. Um, obviously, companies like Floralife, uh, we play a role working with our customers and partners to assure that water quality is there. And uh, we also want to make sure that the proper post-harvest mixing of the proper solution is there. It's a great example of something that Floralife does very well. We actually have a hydrangea solution in, in Latin America at this time that we're developing. And what I'm trying to say with that is, is we want to partner with somebody who understands what you're doing and bring solutions to your table as a grower. 
Uh, from there, you, uh, you want to make sure that you have temperature control uh, to get some of that field latent heat out of it during post-harvest. You want to make sure that you package your product, uh, I assume, in dry pack boxes uh, with low density so there's good air movement. Obviously, the cold chain, nothing replaces the valid um, uh, or the importance of a proper cold chain from the farm all the way to where the distribution may be. And then here again, if you cannot leave this out, is the rehydration step of hydrangeas. So you want somebody the product who is going to rehydrate it after, after it's traveled through the cold chain to you. You want to make sure that that solution has high quality water or good quality water. Uh, that you have a properly mixed rehydration step. Our express technology is ideal for stuff like this. You want to make sure that the container and the bucket and the, and, the, and the countertop have all been sanitized or properly cleaned. So when water does once again come into the vascular system, it fills the whole vascular system. Very commonly hydrangeas will be multi-lobe, meaning two or three or four lobes. Uh, three or two of the lobes will hydrate and one won't. This is a very good example of bacteria playing its role in blocking the water movement. So we wanna make sure we have the right post-harvest solution and the right rehydration solution that's moved properly. After that, um, Georgina, I think the, the importance there is, is keeping the water clean, uh, assuring that there is a constant supply of water so you don't get interruptions in water sourcing, which would may lead air getting into the vascular system or the plumbing system. And therefore, once again, bringing on uh, some of those soft lobes that do not look good. Um, and um, this is one of the crops that we probably recommend more often than not to recut the stem. Uh, even though our express technology, you don't have to when everything is being done correctly. But on the hydrangea, because it's so hydration sensitive, recut that stem, um, get any other bacteria pulled up out of the picture and assure that good water uptake. Okay. Good. And oh, I don't think... Anyone who buys a hydrangea, make sure that they do travel with a flower food sachet so they can mm -hmm. proper care and handling. Yeah, that's actually very important. And then another topic, the wet pack shipping box. So somebody asked if you could explain the science behind the air holes on the wet pack shipping box. We're going to show you what these boxes look like so everybody knows um, what we're talking about. So yeah, can you explain to us the science behind these holes? Sure. So let me explain, because not everybody globally uh, ships flowers in what we call a wet pack. And by the way, these two are, um, I want to thank uh, PCA, which is a box company, for supplying me a photo of these two. Uh, these are not floralized. Um, so this is that final step or the final mile, as we call it in the industry, that's going from the bouquet company through a potentially through a distribution center and then onto a store floor, mostly in supermarkets, but wholesalers also sell in wet pack boxes uh, to, to high traffic areas. Um, so the holes that you see on the left-hand side, um, and by the way, uh, the reason I put the, the sweetest taste example, many times these boxes also serve as a uh, presentation position for, for uh, stores that don't have coolers or are not full service. So I wanted to give you the, the reason why they, they play a different role as well as uh, moving the flowers. So inside of this box, there will be a plastic liner uh, that should come up um, where the flower levels are. The plastic liner should not cover the flowers. And here's the reason for that. So that plastic liner assures that if there's any water spilt, it doesn't spill out of the box and, and ruin the box and possibly even a whole pallet. The idea of the liner is to make sure the water stays present inside of the structure. But let's not forget, flowers are alive. And just like you and I right now, they're respirating. They're taking in oxygen, they're giving off heat, they're giving off carbon dioxide, and they're giving off moisture. If we put a, a bag over that or that liner over that, that moisture, that heat will become trapped inside of that little microclimate and that's not what we want. So we want the liner to come up along the side of the flower, but leave that top open. Now, the holes on the boxes, which you see in the pictures on both of them, actually. So the reason for the holes are, are threefold. Number one, obviously, cold chain management, air exchange. You want the temperature that is building up in the box due to the flower's respiration. 
to leave the box. And hopefully, if you're doing things correctly, you're moving them at 34 to 36 degrees and you want the cold air from that temperature, whether it be a truck or a room, to come into the box and that air exchange is very important. Keeps the cold chain management. That's the, the, the main reason for that, that air, that air uh, holes. But the second one is actually a very good one. You actually have air movement. And whenever you have air movement, you have a reduction in sporation and fungal bacterial buildup. I'm gonna use the word that we all use as a catch-all. It reduces botrytis into this. Now, not always botrytis, it could be many, but we call it botrytis in our industry to cover all of the issues. So the holes allow for air exchange, air movement, which is not only keeps the cold chain, but reduces botrytis. And there is a third reason. As the flowers respirate, one of the hormones or gases it gives off is ethylene. And we know that ethylene plays a trigger role in making the flower move toward a seed. A very natural thing. Now, yes, we treat the flower with post-harvest solutions and, and ethyl block in order to prevent this, but we don't want that ethylene to be trapped in that box. So the holes, that once again, play an important role in moving that air out of that box. And of course, the fourth, and I didn't mention is one of the lists, the holes also uses handles in order to carry the box. <laughs> and, and although obvious, uh, believe it or not, um, we've actually worked on the holes to the point where we kind of force people to handle the boxes a little better because if you put the hole in the right place, the people will handle the boxes properly. If you put them in the wrong place, they'll carry them like a book and then the flowers will be destroyed. So I think those are the reasons for the hole and the importance of uh, maintaining that um, plastic liner inside the box below the flower level. And uh, on a team or in the design of a box, please think of all those things, especially as flowers move through the cold chain, take advantage of it. And don't forget the flowers are alive, generating heat. And we want that heat to come off the flower in order to keep the flower in great condition. And once again, push the base life to that consumer where it belongs. Yes, exactly. So if I'm correct, this white box, those flowers were actually shipped in that box and then used as a display. Correct, yeah, it, it actually comes with a little top, which you see there. And uh, the bucket, uh, and this one, this is a double double bucket. They have single, double, I've even seen a four. They have pallet displays. But all you do is you put that top uh, on top and you drop the buckets in. And so let's say you're a store that doesn't have a cooler or space limited. You can put the floral department anywhere. Um, you often see these at the checkout for that impulse buy, yeah. which uh, floral many times becomes an impulse buy. And uh, it does a great job, especially when you're promoting a certain holiday, like in this case, Swedish Day. Yeah, perfect. Multi-use, which is always good. Right. And let's not forget uh, the other beauty of boxes when they're done correctly is it's recyclable. And, uh, and um, you know, obviously we're trying to reduce things, but at the same time, all, all corrugated or cardboard is recyclable. And by the way, uh, the, the box companies that are in our industry, they do a great job in, in testing and, and meeting uh, demands of, of customers who, who are saying, hey, listen, I want to do this a little different. Can you develop something for me? So re reach out to them. They all, they all do a great job with that. Okay. Thank you for that tip. Ooh, we have another topic that's, um, that's very popular. This was a special request. So apparently, you are well known for explaining the importance of the cold chain. And um, someone who's heard your presentation has asked if you could explain it to the audience of this webinar, um, because they thought it was so interesting to hear all the different aspects that, that come into play. So um, if we could go to the next slide, I have collected the images that you use for your presentation on the cold chain. And um, yeah, wondering if you could explain it to us. Sure. So. Um... LAR stands for Latin American region. And so we pulled the example that, uh, but I think this would be very similar uh, in any part of the world where flowers are being grown in one area um, and being transported to a different marketplace. So uh, I think the first slide there you see would be variety selection. I, I've mentioned it um, many times and I just think it's so important. And uh, for those of you who buy flowers um, and from who you're buying them from, I think the, the conversation of variety collection is important. It should start there really, to make sure they know what they're doing. And, and uh, the second slide you see there is, is basically uh, the fact that you wanna deal with people who are dealing with breeders and there's a cost to that. Um, 
the cost of putting a new variety in the marketplace is amazing. It's a, it's a beautiful science. And at the same time, uh, without it, we wouldn't be where we are. Um, I'll give you one real quick example. Uh, about gosh, maybe 12 years ago now, uh, there was a study done. 10,000 people were asked, how long do you expect flowers to last? The answer was seven days. And then they were asked, how long are they lasting? And the answer was three days. So we weren't doing a great job. Um, good news is right now, uh, people are getting seven days because, and I have to start with the variety selection. Um, the, the genetics of a lot of this is, uh, is there and people who know flowers uh, are doing a good job in, in, in putting the right variety in the right channel as we discussed those different channels. From there, uh, obviously ideal growing. Um, there we talked about water quality. The reason I, I put the little dollar signs or we put the little dollar signs there is, is letting you know all of this comes at a, at a great cost. I mean, the infrastructure of a greenhouse, no matter where it is in the world is expensive. Uh, soil preparation, the labor. Um, and as the world becomes more difficult, even water availability and, and water treatment is, is all expenses. But without that, you don't get the result that we want. The fourth slide there, of course, is, is proper knowledge and, and, and timing. You want to um, harvest the product uh, depending on what market you're going to. You want the right cut stage. Uh, you want the right stem length. All these things meet the specs of what market or channel it's moving into. And, of course, your customer. So there the customer relationship starts, right? If I'm going to a supermarket, I need a certain length. And um, I, I think everybody on the call understands what channel they're working with and the demands that the grower needs to uh, abide by or the specs or the protocols they need to abide by. Uh, from there, of course, we wanna go ahead and post-harvest treat the, the, the flower correctly. That's slide five, that's post-harvest. Uh, whether it be, um, there again, water quality plays a great role. Hopefully your grower has teamed up uh, with a company like Floralife uh, and you're uh, properly post-harvesting you treat your flowers. Some are ethylene sensitive, some are hydration sensitive. And then of course you wanna manufacture whatever it's going to. In this case, there was a bouquet. And of course, then you're transporting it um, to, to the airport, hopefully the ideal condition and the cold chain has already started way from uh, the post-harvest section all the way through to the airline who um, has now flown it to Miami Beach, as you see from the picture there. Uh, Miami is famously holding over 85% of the flowers that come into the country come through Miami. And uh, the next step there is, is actually the, the clearing. Uh, there's actually a very legal uh, processes, which where we inspect uh, not only make sure that what you say is on the bottom, we wanna prevent um, insects and stuff coming in. So there's actually a clearing house. And there again, uh, we wanna then bring the temperature down to ideal. Uh, the picture of that little flower uh, is being pre-cooled. Uh, this step is very important. Uh, I would highly recommend people who are buying flowers to make sure that the flowers, they are, purchasing are getting pre-cooled um, because that brings the flower respiration rate right back down to where it needs to be. We know that during the transportation phase, the flowers do get the cold chain broken because uh, the airport is outside and all these things happen. So that pre-cooling step is very important and it not only needs to be requested, but demanded by people who are paying for flowers. Uh, from there, the transportation um, and, and depending on what channel it's moving to, in, in this picture, we're moving to a supermarket. As you can see, we're rehydrating the flour and then we're trucking it to a DC, which is a distribution center. Uh, the distribution center hopefully checks the quality, make sure the calls are met, and then moves it to the store to where the customer on slide 13, hopefully uh, has now a product that they can take home. And, and, uh, and with the tools we've given them and all the processes, they can have those seven to 10 days and watch the flowers develop. So that's, that's that picture. By the way, I assume we're, we're uh, if anyone wants that, please let us know. I think it's a good explanation um, in cartoon type. Uh, we have this, of course, in real life, but this is a lot more fun to look at, I think. Uh, but without those steps at the beginning, from one, uh, 13 is impossible, especially when we're, again, trying to get those seven to 10 days in full development of flowers. We have a second slide as well. So this was the super floor channel and then we have the slide as well here um, for the wholesaler, which is almost the same. Is there anything you want to mention here on the, any differences or? Yeah. yeah, I think I just wanted to mention that the difference there, of course, is the uh, once uh, the pre-cooling is slide 10, right? Uh, the, all the variety selection, all that, of course, has been prepared. Um, 
But there again, the importance of pre-cooling. And then slide 11 is where we, it may find a different pathway to a wholesaler. Uh, people are buying more and more online flowers, um, uh, directly from farm even. Um, and wholesalers are finding uh, marketplaces in e-commerce. So the flower pathway to the customer is very great. There are wholesalers who are supplying supermarkets. There are supermarkets who are supplying retail florists. It gets very crazy. The e-commerce is supplying everybody. So I, I think the industry is finding its way. Uh, each person's demands are being met by different channels. But I think in, instead of a distribution center, we have a wholesaler. Uh, the advantage of a wholesaler in many cases is they get to many times rehydrate the flowers for the retailer or the party planner. And they have a good eye and they can assure the quality will be there. Um, and I think these are flower experts handling flowers. And they do add that extra line of protection defense. And in many cases, they really know how to abide by the cold chain, where some of the other channels, like uh, I guess the e-commerce channel, that final mile is done by FedEx, who is not in the flower business or the transportation business. So I think that that is the reason why we see a little medical wholesaler there making sure the flower quality is there. So I say that's the difference. And do you have anything to add for the other global markets? For Europe, for Asia? Yes, yes. good point. Uh, so as we all know, uh, in Europe, we work through an auction um, and the auction, um, uh, they kind of play the role of um, that step 11. Um, I've been to the auction several times. Uh, it is temperature controlled. In my opinion, the times that I have been, it hasn't been uh, 32 to 36, but uh, it is temperature controlled. And then the distribution from the auction is done in refrigerated trucks uh, and they move out uh, directly. So in the auction picture or in the European uh, auction picture, the auction kind of plays the role of the wholesale. And then uh, uh, actually go refrigerated retail florist in many cases, but we're seeing uh, the auction moving around it. Uh, the auction still plays a role economically in it by sourcing and maintaining quality and very strict specs on the industry. But we're seeing flowers moving, uh, not always through the auction, especially in the supermarket channel, they're moving directly to the supermarkets and through the bouquet companies. So it's, uh, it's changing. Um, again, I think that's all part of what we're experiencing right now. Uh, the flowers are finding their way uh, to the market, depending on the needs of each area. So before uh, the people adapted to what was available, now what's available is adapting to the people's needs. And I think that's what we're seeing with e-commerce growth, and, uh, some of the roles um, in supermarkets. I mean, we have supermarkets that are doing weddings and funerals. And so you really see a gray area, um, you know, past slide 10, <laughs> where, where things are changing. That's very true. Okay, thank you for that. Those were the questions that were um, sent in via email. But we did get a number of questions during your conversation, during this presentation. Um, and so I'm going to ask you those questions. And one was, I endorse the importance of adding flower food. On the other hand, I am convinced that preparing the flowers with a sharp and clean cut is equally important. What is your opinion? Well, um, with the technology that we have now, this express technology, um, before that, I would agree with you 100%. Um, and the clean part of that cut was a very important, uh, whether it be a, a clipper with two live sides, giving a clean cut, making that vascular system available to hopefully the properly mixed flower food, water, or hydration solution. I would agree with you. With this new express technology, we are finding a very consistent uh, and it's, by the way, it is, it, when I say new, it's really out for several years now, already being used by millions of stems daily. And um, uh, without, I mean, we have, a, we have a hold on that market right now. Florida, we're very proud of this technology. And all I can say, if you haven't tried it, uh, I would recommend trying it without cutting the stems. And you're going to be amazed. As a very old horticulturist, uh, I, I was a grower. When it first came out, even within my own company, I had some serious doubts because of the importance of the cut. So I thought like you did, but not until I see the consistency, the labor saving, even some handling benefits. You handle the product less. The flower appreciates not being handled so much. And there are some clear benefits to it. 
And uh, I see actually a more consistent use with express technology, not cutting the stems, than when you cut them and maybe miss one or two and you get maybe one or two flowers in a bunch not hydrated. The express technology takes care of that. Mm -hmm. And the other huge advantage would be at a supermarket channel, uh, and actually there are two. One is if a customer pulls two bunches and selects one, hopefully, and doesn't put the other one all the way back into the solution water, somebody just comes back and pushes it back in and the flower rehydrates. It, it's an amazing saving. And we all know the labor cost and the labor availability at store level is really difficult to do. And to do. <laughs> and uh, that that is a huge benefit for that product. The other one is in the sachet, we also like offer the express technology. And many customers, especially in the US, don't really know to cut the stems. They were always been told to put flowers in water. So with this, they put the sachet in, they put the flowers in, it's it hydrate. Um, and believe it or not, we have found uh, that the consumer experience enjoys that consistency, that ease of use. And that's adding to finding out. Uh, not to buying flowers so they don't feel like they killed the flowers yep. <laughs> by not cutting them. Yeah. Okay. Thank you for that. Was a good answer. Um, someone's asking, <laughs> I keep hearing that there are different tricks um, to use instead of flower foods, such as bleach, sugar, Sprite. Can you please tell us which concoction is the best for flowers? So that's a great question. And, uh, and at the risk of getting fired, um, which is uh, maybe a favorite to everyone. So it's interesting. Um, what, what's in flower food and, and what's in, let's say, Sprite uh, are very similar um, concoctions. And I say Sprite or 7-Up only because those are clear looking. right? And if you think about it, there's an acidifier, there's uh, carbohydrates. Um, where it differs is that what's in the flower food mix is designed for the flower. So um, for those of you who went to college or maybe misbehaved in the past and you woke up in the morning and there was that, that Sprite that you left overnight and you went to taste it and it tasted incredibly sweet. Well, um, what's happened is that the Sprite, it's lost its ability to maintain the balance. And now the sugar overtakes it. And you don't want that because um, when the sugar overtakes it, you're only feeding the bacterium and the, and the fungus that are in there. And the flowers will only develop dirty water very quickly. And understand that the flower food makers of the world, ourselves, our competitors, uh, the good ones are, are developing a product designed for the flower. So the Sprite, uh, there are some other ones. Um, aspirin is one, uh, Viagra is one if you could afford it. All these things do bring some chemistry to it, but aren't done in the right balance in order for the flower to basically enjoy it past that initial moment. Uh, once again, we're trying to get those seven to 10 days. So if I had to say the best one, the best concoction would probably be the Sprite uh, on day one, because it has the carbohydrates and it has some chemical in there to make sure the Sprite stays fresh. And, uh, but in the long run, it's not gonna do the flower any good. And when I say the long run, I mean the next day. Um, so unless you wanted to wake up every morning, cut the flowers, new Sprite. By the way, Sprite's expensive, at least it is in my town. So I don't really know. I think the flower <laughs> Choice. Yeah, I agree with you on that one. <laughs> okay, so another question: What does a geotropic flower mean? I'm assuming a geotropic, geotropic. Yeah, geotropic flower. And it sounds like a friend of mine is throwing me questions. Thanks, whoever that is. Uh, a geotropic flower is um, a flower which is affected by, uh, believe it or not, by gravity. Um, so. There are flowers that are affected by light. They're called phototropic. Uh, the sunflower you see right there, you'll actually move to the flower. That's called phototropic. Uh, geotropic flowers are flowers which actually work away from gravity. And um, so many times, if you've ever had a box, let's say of uh, a delphinium, or, or no, excuse me, of, uh, I'm gonna use another one that's a little better than that. Uh, Molicella, or you'll see them bend in different directions because the flower box places them all, and then they bend because they move away from gravity. And uh, then you put them in water and they have all these weird bends. So geotropism is uh, basically the flower's ability to move away from gravity. And it does it in an interesting way. Imagine a flower uh, being like my finger, 
Uh, the cells on this side of the flower will elongate and the flower, the cells on this side of the flower will not elongate, therefore bending the flower in that direction. And uh, the flower has a hormone which causes the elongation and it'll actually move it on the side where the gravity is not and it'll cause the flower to bend. So that's geotropism. Okay, interesting. I'd never heard of that before. Yeah, it's kind of cool. You can actually watch it online, I'm sure. Interesting. Um, this is probably an elaborate one, but um, Steve, what is your forecast regarding new varieties? So that's a good question because um, in conversations with people in the industry that I'm fortunate to have, uh, especially buyers, people who make decisions for, for, for a large amount of stems, the first question they ask us is, what's new? What's, what's the new flower coming? And people like myself, people think that I know, or people think that Georgina knows or whoever is on the call, they have a secret to a new flower type, which by the way, it's a competitive market. So uh, a new flower type into the marketplace is, uh, is capturing market, right? People who haven't seen that. Uh, it could be something as uh, common now as a bi-color rose, which believe it or not, not that long ago, supermarkets were returning roses because there was two colors. Hey, these, these are burnt. No, that, that's a bi-color rose. So now that's commonplace. But what's happened during the pandemic is the cost of breaking out a new variety is, is very high. And um, so to bring out something that's very unique into a marketplace that isn't ready for it, you could lose a lot of money. And by the way, I'm not talking hundreds of dollars. I'm talking millions of dollars. So a new variety uh, has to be rolled out into a proper market. It's not an easy situation to get a new variety because once you've rolled it out, you need to have the plant material to offer it to the market. So there are a lot of costs involved in this. And currently right now, we are trying to keep up with the varieties that we currently have. And the breeders are trying to catch up with the demand. So it's probably not a great time to roll out a new variety. So the variety pictures that we have now are probably the ones that we're gonna see in the short term, the next maybe year or two. Um, some breeders are gonna to have to roll out some varieties because they've already started that rollout, but it's a difficult task uh, to, ask some, to, to ask for extra money for a new variety when the marketplace is already demanding extra costs because of all the pandemic and transportation and logistical costs that are happening. So the reason I'm mentioning that is I think it's, it's interesting and we have to recognize that we do need new varieties, uh, but when they do come, there is a cost to them. And that cost should be enjoyed in the marketplace, especially if the variety is well accepted. But at the same time, I think right now, it's gonna be difficult to look for that new unique product when the marketplace is pulling at these breeders in all different kinds of directions. So that's a good question. I, I really think that's something that's important for all the decision makers who buy flowers to recognize uh, the value of a new variety. And I think this pandemic period is teaching us that. Why is it, why, that, why is it that there are no seasons when flowers coming out of Columbia? No, there are, that's a good question. There, there are seasons. Um, it's just that as you get closer to the equator, you get less variance. Um, if there are any Colombians on the phone, they would tell you they have seasons. Uh, unfortunately, one is rainy, uh, which is, creates a real problem for fungus and bacteria. Um, but there are seasons that they're just minimized by the period of time. We don't have the extremity of the low, but we do have periods of time where uh, we do get uh, cold temperatures in, in, in Kenya, in, um, in Colombia, in Ecuador. So no, there are seasons and they do generate havoc on the timing because uh, in order for us to have the right flower at the right time for the right season, the obvious one is roses for Valentine's Day. Um, you actually have to pinch knowing your varieties, knowing at what altitude, uh, sunlight, an example, uh, everybody thinks that sunlight is the same. Uh, sunlight, there is a number of hours and then there's quality of light. So the spectrum is different. Growing flowers is a science. And uh, so knowing where you are and what, and what you're trying to do and for what marketplace. Uh, so there are seasons and uh, the growers have to take all this into account in order to get the flower you want, when you want it, how you want it. So uh, that's a misnomer. There are seasons that the growers have to wrestle with and 
Uh, like right now in Ecuador, we're, we're getting cold temperatures that are slowing things down from what I understand from some of our partners. Okay. Can you please explain what an acidifier is and is it harmful? So uh, an acidifier is um, anything that lowers the pH. Uh, so the pH scale is one to 14, um, seven being neutral, all right? So um, for those of you who are my age, uh, uh, and who used to have hair, um, we used to buy pH balanced shampoo, which by the way is the worst thing for shampoo. You need, you need to clean your hair. Uh, but long story made short. So from zero to seven is acid and from, um, or zero to 6.9, from 7.1 is basic. So I think we all know what acid is, you know, it's lemon juice is, is acid and, and basic are starches and all that. Um, so what we want to do with flowers in order to increase the water uptake, we want to acidify the water to an, to an ideal level. Uh, we go back to water quality here. So we need to know what the water quality is. We want to make sure that there's a buffer. Every water has a buffering ability that the, the quality of water is good. There's not a lot of salts in the water because water is H2O, but, um, that's pure water. And believe it or not, even pure water could be a bad experience for flowers because the flowers are made up of 90% plus of, of water, but the other percentage is other things. So if you got a flower and put it in pure water, the water from the stem would actually leach out into the pure water because we're trying to reach that balance. Uh, nature's always trying to reach a balance. So, so through osmosis, of nature to reach a balance, you want to make sure that you acidify the water to increase that uptake. Now, can it be damaging? Well, yes. Uh, if you improperly add too much acid to flowers, you will burn them. Uh, of course, acid in, uh, in any low and great amounts of anything can be damaging, but so can high base too. So uh, please work with your, um, with your flower food expert, whoever he may be, hopefully it's a floral life one, and we'll assure that you are dosing your products correctly, uh, that your water quality is good, and that you are getting the benefits of that hydration step in order for you to move the flower toward the consumer once again, making sure he gets those seven to 10 days in the developing product. Can you explain why some roses get black tips at times? Is it a bad rose? Is it a disease? Wow, what a, what a great question. So, um, Red roses, by the way, all, all roses um, tend to have different colors. And these, these are the pigments and stuff that live inside of them. Not to get too crazy scientific, but on many of the red varieties, we get in what we call a black edging or an oxidation. And um, especially in, that, in some of the varieties that were very common, like the freedom, we seem to get that. And what scientists have found is due to the light spectrum, at certain altitudes, there is an abundance of buildup of carbohydrates and, and these tend to generate a buildup of these hormones or, and of these pigments inside of the petal. Now, as you look at a rose, uh, don't forget the first couple of petals on a rose aren't really petals, those are guard petals. Those are actually true leaves. And these tend to be the darker ones. But as you look at a rose at the edge of the petal, uh, it gets thicker and thicker as it gets toward the, toward, toward the flower. So basically every day due to respiration, there is a release of certain moistures. Those moistures carry some of those pigments. Some of those pigments end up on the edge of the petal. When the light hits those pigments, they react causing that edging. I know that sounds complicated, but if you were in the microscopic world, you would actually see it happen. Growers have learned to minimize that and it's not a bad rose. As a matter of fact, it's a very healthy rose. By putting different plastics, different color plastics on these greenhouses, and it minimizes, it does not stop it. It minimizes it. Certain times a year when the light becomes longer days, we get an increase in this. And as the nights get colder, we get a larger buildup of carbohydrates, which is good for the rose. It's a stronger, healthier, longer lasting rose but we get a buildup of carbohydrates, which in turn builds up of pigments, which in turn a little bit of the edging. It's actually a beautiful thing. It could be very attractive. It makes one rose look different than the other and understand it's not a bad rose. Now, 
if the rose has been damaged during transportation and you see a blackening due to damage, that's a different situation. But I don't think that's what the question was about. Okay. Um, why is it bad for flowers to miss, um, to miss the blooms with water? So uh, misting flowers with water only increase um, uh, the potential of uh, fungus and bacteria. Um, understand that the one place where there is no free oxygen to breathe for the flower to, is where the water is. So if you put up, just like if you and I were underwater, there is oxygen because water is made up of H2O, but we can't breathe it, it's not accessible. So the misting of the flowers uh, only basically increase uh, and, and bring um, to the flower an opportunity for fungus and bacteria looking for scars, tissue entry, for bacteria and fungus to, to, to find a home and to set up shop, which you do not want. Um, much more importantly, high quality water, properly mixed flower food, um, good air circulation, and ideal temperature. I see a lot of videos of people dipping hydrangeas, dipping the flowers into water and saying that that's the best way to hydrate them, but that would be the same thing as, as misting them, wouldn't it? Yeah, uh, actually even more so because, so, so it, the, the, the trick, <laughs> The trick does work because basically through that osmosis, the water is going into the vascular system. What they don't show you in the video is the next day, the condition of the hydrangea. Uh, the system is designed through the vascular system to the flowers up the stem. You have to generate that pathway. Yeah. I could hydrate by dumping the hydrangea and it'll fill up with water. But in some cases, only an hour later, it'll be right back to where because it starts to respirate and it loses that ability. So you have to get the water up the stem, which is the way it was designed by the man upstairs. Um, and you have to get that, 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 that pathway, not only set up, but flowing. So as the water leaves the stomates and the petals and all that, it is replaced immediately by new water. And hopefully that is clean water, properly mixed flower food. And I, <laughs> So yeah, it's, it's a trick. It's not one that works very well for, for the consumer who's hoping to get seven to 10 days of good life. So you mentioned before that it's not necessary to cut flowers if you're using the express technology, but in a circumstance that you don't have express technology, or for example, you have a flower type that's better to cut, do you then recommend cutting at an angle or cutting it straight? So uh, there is a... And by the way, we've seen it in a million videos. And so the idea of um, cutting a flower at an angle um, is that you increase the surface area available to the flower to drink water. But it's really not true. The vascular system is, uh, uh, is basically millions of little tubes and there's a million of them. Whether I cut it this way or straight or this way, it's still a million tubes. Where the advantage of the angle becomes interesting from a design perspective is that it allows you to go into floral foam, uh, Oasis, for example, it, easier, le less, less friction. So there's a benefit there. Um, it's, whenever you cut a stem, unless you're using an electron microscope, you're going to cut it at some sort of an angle. Because um, the other idea is that when you put the flowers in the vase, they sit on the bottom of the vase and they clog. Uh, that would be incredible because the molecules of water could probably fit uh, underneath the stem. So I, I don't think it's important that you cut at an angle or not, unless you're a designer and which you want to move to, because the, the vascular system is the same at an angle as it is this way. Um, much more importantly is that you have a clean base and you properly mixed. Uh, and if you are using a clipper, uh, a cutter, that it is sanitized um, using some sort of sanitizer like DCD and our products line. And uh, once again, the water quality is in the proper hydration and you're following the cold chain. So the angle I think is only important to designers. I'm not a designer, but I have noticed a difference when you do have um, that aspect that's easier to, to penetrate the floral oasis foam. Yeah. Someone is asking, what is the next big thing for the floral industry? So that, that's a great question. Um, and uh, we've already touched on the variety thing. Um, and we see that's going to be probably pending. But I think the next big thing is um, one that I try to mention a couple of times, maybe unsuccessfully, and I'm sorry, is, is 
the consumer is learning where to get flowers in places they didn't used to. Uh, E-commerce is the obvious one, right? But I can actually log on right now to a farm in Kenya if I am in, in Belgium, and I can actually buy direct from that farm. I can actually tell that farm I want that flower. Um, and I think that's amazing. Uh, and I think that's what we're seeing. The other big thing is the importance of sustainability. Um, the industry in all of the channels are adhering and noticing that sustainability is going to play a great role in this. Uh, at Floral Life, we have definitely done so. Please search out your suppliers to make sure they're doing it. Um, by the way, in many cases, the sustainability process is actually a saving cost-wise. Doing things sustainable doesn't always mean additional cost. It can in some cases, but we have to recognize that the industry is not going to continue if we're not sustainable. And this also means social sustainability, making sure that the, the labor force is, is, is finding a, a, a great lifestyle. Uh, we, we, um, we're fighting right now for labor all over the world. Um, and to be honest with you, it, to grow flowers takes a very unique person. Uh, and uh, it's a beautiful job. But at the same time, we're fighting for more profitable. Industry. So I think sustainability and social aspects of our are not a new thing, but it's going to become a more and more important thing as we demand it from us. And at Floral Life, I know we're doing a great job of sustainability, but reach out to your suppliers to make sure they are too. I think sustainability is a, is a big topic and it's, it's a definitely a global aspect everyone is focusing on. Okay, I think this is going to be our last question because we're, we're coming near the hour. Um, it's actually a follow-up on the misting of blooms. So what is the purpose of finishing sprays? So Floral Life has a number of finishing sprays and this person wants to know if misting a bloom with water isn't good, is it then okay to use these finishing sprays um, on the blooms? And how does that differ from water? Yeah, no, you're, that's, a, that's a good point. So, um, so now we're entering with the misting, uh, the misting products, finishing touch. Um, there are several in the industry. Um, so basically what we're doing there, that's a design item. Um, and without a doubt, we, we have found it to be effective. So let's say I am uh, preparing for a wedding this afternoon in Miami. It's going to be 1,200 degrees Fahrenheit in Miami this afternoon. But my wedding is out on the beach and I have these beautiful bouquets that need to look good and some have hydrangeas on them, some have white roses. So the technology between the finishing touches and uh, are that they actually coat the flower with an anti-transparent type product that will actually reduces that water loss because the flowers are gonna be respirating much like we are right now again and giving off. But if I can coat the stomates and the openings of the flowers, it'll reduce that. But by no means is this a horticultural or a physiological thing. This is actually just a physical blocking of that. Now, uh, our company, we do have a product that actually uh, does play with some uh, science that uh, slows down that loss of water. But by no means is this a solution to shipping flowers out of water and expecting the water to stay in. It's not a plastic bag. Flowers are still going to they're going to transpirate, they're going to lose water. So these design tools do reduce that water loss, but by no means are, are they a solution to properly hydrating and keeping flowers um, in, in, um, in either floral foam that's been with flower food and or a base with properly made flower food. Okay. And so spraying the heads with, with these products does not let bacteria enter or motivate that in any way? You, you know what, uh, I don't know the answer to the, about the bacterial issue. I do know the idea is to prevent or reduce transpiration and respiration water loss. They're, so they form sort of a barrier. And like I said, I know some of our products have some, some other chemistry that we will we'll leave out of the picture. But the idea is that, uh, that it closes the stomachs and it prevents that water loss. And, that, that's, and it's a design. It, it's, it's basically because at some point I have to have a boutonniere with the flower on my and I can't carry a base around my, my, my suit, right? Or our wedding. So at some point you have to, uh, the flower has to leave water for certain situations and, uh, and these work real well. Yep. Oh, well, that's a perfect timing, Steve, because it's exactly uh, the end of the, the webinar. Thank you so much for 
all your enthusiasm and your answers and the interaction. It was 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 really good. I'm getting compliments nonstop here on the on the chat. So thank you for your time and for all the effort. Um, and thank you to our audience as well for joining us and for participating. We had uh, quite a number of questions. Um, I do want to emphasize that Flora Life is a global company and Steve is just one of our experts and specialists that we have. We have quite a few other people as smart as Steve in the company um, that are specialized or, or even more that are specialized in different topics. So if at any point in time, you know, even if there's no webinar scheduled, if you have a question relating to flowers, flower care, or, you know, any design questions, send them to us, send them to me. My email address is on screen and I'll make sure that they get forwarded to the correct person and we'll get you an answer. Um, and, you know, any questions that come in, we like to use those as well as webinar topics. So if there are topics that you would like us to present on or have, you know, want a background story about, let us know, you know, we're always looking for good topics to, to present to you. So thank you for your time and thank you for your attention. And Steve, thank you.